Uh, we've been talking about uh, the legal frameworks to have access to users' data, but I wanted to add to this discussion the possibility of governments hacking into users' devices. Uh, recent news stories reported that Brazilian authorities have had contact with companies that provide these surveillance solutions for governments, such as the Italian hacking team. Mm -hmm. um, other stories suggest that Brazilian authorities have pushed telcoms companies to adopt it and use malware infiltration and to obtain information storage in cell phones. What are the risks uh, for human rights associated with government hacking? And in what cases, if any, this could be legitimated? Also, I could just comment uh, on the recent amendment on Rule 41 of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedures in the US. I think that should add something interesting to the discussion. Sure. Um, so Access Now, last year, we published a report called um, Government Hacking and Human, or Human Rights Approach to Government Hacking. And we tried to look at specifically um, what impact hacking has on human rights protections for users. And so we looked at the different types of government hacking and really the different motivations that governments may have. Um, for example, to, to conduct surveillance, which is a big one, um, to get access to user data. Um, governments have hacked into um, devices in order to um, what we call messaging control. Um, to dictate a very certain message and to ensure that um, either a message is promoted or um, kind of tampered down. Um, and then a third one is to do some sort of damage. Um, you can hack into devices, for example, um, to make them explode or to set, you know, make them overheat in a way. Um, and so to do physical world damage. You often hear in the US these um, members of Congress talking about you know, cyber war and they're going to hack into the electric grid and shut down the electric grid. That is this causing damage scenario. Um, and what we've determined is that those, those second two, the messaging control and the causing damage are just absolutely inconsistent with human rights protections um, under current, what is currently um, capable, what they are currently capable of doing. That surveillance, motivated hacking might be consistent with human rights. We said that we, we do not contone government hacking. We actually think that government hacking is bad for users for a whole range of reasons. It is very different from different types of surveillance. We are very clear that this is not something that we think should be blessed. But we are also clear that we know governments are doing it. We know it's not going to stop anytime soon um, and that we are in this very real world of um, governments all over the world trying to hack into devices. And so what we try to say practically is if you're going to do that for surveillance, you need to have a legal framework in place. You cannot simply contract with a company like Hacking Team um, or use existing surveillance authority that was designed for less invasive activity than hacking um, to cram in the use of these very invasive tools. Um, and we set out 10 safeguards, and we say these are what you need to have in law. Things like greater transparency, um, an assurance that you're not going to cause damage, and that you're going to try to remove the malware from the device after the hacking operation. Um, we think that this is necessary. Now that said, Rule 41 um, in the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure in the United States is the rule that governs what magistrate judges, um, where they can um, authorize searches. So it, it essentially said, with a few exceptions, that you, a magistrate judge can only authorize a search in the jurisdiction where the device is to be searched. And it was this practical limit on government hacking because a lot of times they were hacking into devices because they didn't know where they were located. And what several courts had said is that you cannot authorize a warrant for something where you don't know where it is because of Rule 41 and this requirement that the object be present in your jurisdiction. Um, the recent amendments, which were passed by a federal committee, uh, approved by the Supreme Court, and then they went to Congress, and all Congress had to do was nothing, and they went into effect. You know, normally the, the rule is Congress passes a law and the law changes. Here it was just by inaction 
the rule change would go into effect. And the rule change said, in certain scenarios, basically government hacking scenarios, that the judge, it added this new exception that said the judge, a magistrate judge could issue a warrant for government hacking. Um, our opinion on that change was that it was putting the cart before the horse because we don't have the legal framework that I said is necessary for government hacking. So we were removing these procedural barriers to make it easier to hack into object, into devices without having thought through the substantive rules that need to be in place as well. Um, so we think that that is a, a very negative thing. We're now in a scenario where we're not sure how government is using these authorities, but we know they are um, after that rule change went into effect. And we still don't have the proper substantive rules in place for it. And we think that all countries should really be considering a legal framework. Um, and we're seeing it. We see it in the Netherlands has a law on government hacking. Italy just proposed a law on government hacking that they want to pass. It's actually noting that we don't think they should be hacking. It is quite good um, and quite protective for a law. Um, Australia has a framework. We would like to see more countries move into that world of having a legal framework.